The story begins with a man wanting to play a game for over 10 years, and discovering an endless game while searching. He decided to play the game and choose Hell Mode as the difficulty. That day, the man himself had disappeared from Earth. He was a single 35 years old salary man and he reincarnated as a baby named Alan. It had been five years now and his status after reincarnate was Surf. Surf couldn't have another job and he wasn't allowed to go out of the village. In one hot day he offered his help to his mother but she refused and told him to go out and play. While his mother was praising him for being kind, he was thinking about how he used to pretend to be a child. He couldn't tell them about his reincarnation because he didn't want to scare his family in that world. Summoning was generating creatures from cards using magic power. The idea was to have a partner in the fight, but it seemed that he couldn't fight magical beasts in that world yet. He wanted to be able to fight with the beast so his objective for now was the beast's blessing. He can increase his status using the beast's blessing from those 20 slots of card holders. With that, his physical strength was now comparable to the average adult. To control one's status was to control the game, he believed. But he thought strength was worthwhile for now. The afternoon bell started to ring and his friend Krina called him to play some games together. Krina was his sparring partner and she also couldn't go on hunting for magical beasts. They started to play and it was too embarrassing for a former 35-year-old man. And it wasn't easy to play with Krina. She was faster than him even though he had increased his agility. With Kranus' attack, it seems that he was about to lose the 10th time. Krina seems to have so much fun with Alan more than her father. When she stated that, Alan warned her to not let Mr. Gerda, her father, hear that. Alan seemed frustrated to be crushed by a little girl. Since it was obvious from his face, his father came and told him not to feel bad about himself, because his opponent was a sword saint after all, and she will serve the royal family one day. Alan already knew that something was strange about Krina, and he finally understood why she was attending the appraisal ceremony. But Krina preferred to be a sword man rather than a sword saint. She said that something was written about Alan's talent too, and she heard that it was something special. When she asked, Alan's father explained that even though it was special, no one was able to read the letters, so the priest said that he had no talent. Alan knew that even if someone could read the letters, there would be no change because it was showing errors of garbled characters. He was praying to God to fix the talent system, and because of that, he missed the time to talk about being a summoner. His little brother wondered what was wrong with him as he didn't look happy. His father and mother comforted him by saying that even though he had no talent he was still their proud son, and they believed that he would grow to be a strong man. The family he was in was so poor that they didn't even have a bath, but he was too glad to be reincarnated to that family. His father was 25 years old and his mother was 23 years old which means they were still younger than him. While they were talking, Cranus' father came and it was time to go. Today was the day that knights were coming to meet Crana the Sword Saint, and Alan was her companion. While they were walking, the people who saw Krina started to talk about her respectfully. The caste gap between commoners and serfs was big as always. Suddenly, Alan saw the freckled boy who had been bullying him. The boy didn't think he had anything to do with that as Alan had no talent. Krina defended Alan and her father stopped her. When Alan was asked if he was fine, he said that he didn't care what the other kid said. A man announced that the knight had arrived and told people to make way. The kid's eyes sparkled when they saw the leader of the swordsman knights. The leader asked if she was the sword saint and Krina confirmed him. Unexpectedly, the man said that they had to have a duel to test her talent. False talent was a capital crime. When her father tried to object, the man stated that if she refused, he and his daughter would be sentenced to death. Alan was furious and found that unreasonable. Krina's father was still not pleasant with the idea of that, but she seemed to be fine with it and accepted to do it. Her opponent was a man named Ryfriend, and he was a spear user. Krina's father was worried but it seemed like she was having fun with a grown man. She swung her sword like it had no weight, making everyone surprised except Alan because he knew that she had been playing knight since she was three and her swordsman hip skill surpassed his even in hell mode. He finds a chance to kick her to the wall and creates a huge damage. Krina's father couldn't bear watching that scene but the soldiers were holding him. Alan wanted to do something but his current status was too low to fight back, but he didn't want her and her family to die. Suddenly, Krina stood up. She jumped on him to counterattack and she was successful. She was about to continue but the leader stopped her. She thanked Rifrand and called him an old man offending him. People started to cheer up and praise her. Her father embraced her and asked if she was injured but she seemed fine. Alan was amazed by her one more time. He admitted that the king would be happy to see that. When she asked if she could be a knight now, he said that she needed to wait until she was 12 and then enter the academic city for talented kids. The freckled boy asked if he could go to the academy and the leader said that he was going to send an instructor for the entrance exam. Alan looked at everyone's stars and Krina had more stars than the captain. He figured that the stars play a crucial role in status. It seemed that he was the only one living with hell mode in that world and his 100 times effort in hell mode equals an effort in normal mode. Even though there were no growth limits it was still null. 
If three stars hold such strength, he wondered how strong he could become. He opened his status and was bummed to see his level being stuck on one for the past five years. However, he knew that his life as a summoner was just getting started. After the Swordmaster was discovered, his nameless village was renamed Karina Village. Fall had come and he was six now, but still at level one. Starting at three years old, after practicing a thousand times, his throwing skill had reached level three, but he would need another five years to reach hell mode. After practicing his daily throwing exercise, he went home. At night, his father was late today, which was a strange thing. His dad was the leader of the Beast Hunter team in fall and winter. Farmers weren't allowed to do business, so they had to accept it in order to earn more income. When he checked outside, he saw a bunch of men, including Karina's father, carrying his dad. Teresia, Alan's mother, was sobbing her eyes out when she saw her husband Rodan's heavily injured body. Karina's father told her to calm down. Rodan's wound was already closed. Teresia asked where they found that expensive medicine. They found a mirage flower in the woods and the knights gave them money to buy it. Alan was questioning what was happening because his dad could defeat over three meter tall greed boars and fight ten of those every year, and his level was always raised considerably. He eventually asked Karina's father and he said that according to the directive of the village chief, this year, commoners could also participate and they thought it was easy money, but then panicked and broke the team formation. Rodan did his best to protect them but ended up getting the most damage. They spent all night waiting for Rodan to wake up, and when the sun rose he opened his eyes. Teresia and Alan's little brother embraced Rodan while crying from happiness this time. Alan was the oldest there but couldn't understand why he felt so strange seeing them all together. Between him and that family he felt like there was an invisible wall. Gelda told Rodan to rest and reassured him that he would take care of everything until Rodan completely healed. Alan interrupted him saying that it was fine and he was going to take care of his dad's business. He was not going to allow anyone to harm his family. His parents were shocked, it was time for him to quit pretending like a kid and he made his decision. The next day arrived and he had already started to work. Farmers had to give the landlord 60% of the harvested crops. To ensure that his family would get through that winter, he needed to store up enough food so he worked hard. Two days later he seemed to have a lot more than he needed. It was time for the meat and after a while he was done with that either. The experience he had accumulated for so long was finally enough to open the new skill called Card Enhancement, and it was used to increase the summon's stats. He even got some new members. He summoned Bianta and ordered it to use its skill. With his provoke, he could catch about 50 birds, then they would be fine for the winter. But there weren't any birds around even though Biantas were using their skill. Suddenly an Albaheron came. Alan's dad got inspired by that monster bird when he named Alan. He was huge, about at least two meters tall. He didn't expect that, but it was a once in a lifetime chance, so he prepared himself to hunt his first demon beast. He threw a rock at him and it seemed that his throwing skill was great but he wasn't strong enough to defeat it with one hit. He summoned his dogs and ordered them to bite the bird. The dogs started biting the Albaheron's body, but 15 dogs were not enough because the bird was a D rank. Albaheron didn't seem to be affected by the dogs and it crushed Alan's body with its one foot. Alan was trying to hold it back while thinking of a way to defeat the beast. Then he summoned Chu and ordered him to such its blood. The pressure was lessened, so it was his chance to counterattack. He was right about using an energy drain in that situation. He used three insects and 10 dogs. The bonus stats from Blessing decreased, but most importantly, he tired out his opponent so he had a winning chance now. He gathered all his strength and swung his sword. With one last move, Albaheron was defeated and he received 100 experience points. He shouted happily and was proud of himself. It felt even more awesome than he thought. Karina and the others were all shocked, especially his father. While they were waiting for the blood to dry, Gelda informed Alan that he had passed his words to the village chief. And if he defeated more Albaherons in the future, then aside from the wings and the gall to refine magic stones, he could have the rest of them. Alan thanked Gelda. Now that he knew Biota's Provoke works on demon beasts, he was going to fight an Albaheron every three days. He remembered that he got 100 experience points, and when he checked his status, he saw that his stats increased by a lot, and he had finally level 2 after 6 years. That was a really long time as expected of the Hell Mode. His strength and magic were also significantly higher than they were at level 1. He knew that it would increase but didn't expect that much. Since it had been a month now, his father's injuries were fine now and he decided to talk with them about something. They sat face to face and Alan started to explain what he had been hiding from them. When he was one year old, Alina once said that he needed to overcome many challenges that hundreds of people couldn't overcome, and he had been bestowed with enough special knowledge to do that. While he was explaining he wondered about their expressions after he finished talking. They seemed quite shocked and didn't want to believe it was true. His father patted his head and said that since birth, he not only had a different hair color from them, but he was also an incredible child, which was why they didn't believe the result of the ceremony, and he believed everything he was saying. Alan apologized for hiding it from them. 
His father guessed that he had gone through his first challenge. Alan questioned how he knew that and he said that the small scar on his face disappeared. This made him realize that after leveling up, his old injuries would be healed. Rodan said that he had been given impossible challenges by the ruler of the world so whenever it gets too hard, he said that he should remember that he had his family with him always. Rodan then asked if Gelda knew about that because that man was always so proud of his girl so that was his payback. December came, and Alan and Gelda left the house for the last step. The final step to ensure Alan's family's survival through the winter was exchanging the meat for firewood and salt. While on their way, Alan wanted to ask something but didn't want Gelda to tell his parents. He asked how a farmer could become a commoner. This made Gelda a bit nervous but he answered anyway. He said that he needed 10 coins and the landlord would promote him to a commoner, including the unborn baby inside Alan's mother, his family had five members which meant they needed 50 coins. He decided that before he left Karina village, he was going to help his family become commoners. After a few days of scouting the market, he figured that he needed to kill 500 Albaherons to earn 50 coins which would take a few years. He wanted to buy a new weapon, but an iron rod was enough to take down two Albaherons, and he needed to save up for the food and necessities. He heard someone's voice calling him and when he looked up, that freckled guy was there asking what he was doing in front of his dad's shop. He was the son of the weapon shop owner. The kid said that he would let him go if he could take a few hits. Alan hated that kind of useless fights that don't give any experience points in games. When he ignored him and turned to take off the things on his back, the kid thought he was running away, but he was just getting ready to fight. Alan said that he didn't need to ask because he would knock down whoever stood in his way. He told him to come at him in a competing manner. The kid seemed pretty mad and immediately went to attack but Alan easily dodged him. He was nothing compared to Karina. He defeated him in a second and asked if he wanted to do it again. The kid was trembling and sweating in anger and said that he was going to beat him next time. He said that he would buy something next time and left the shop. Nine months passed and little Miura was born. While Teresha was watching them with the baby in her arms, Alan and Dogora were fighting again. But it didn't seem like it was an actual fight as Alan was instructing him about his movements. Alan had been practicing with Mashu, his brother who was three years old, and Dogora. He couldn't wait for the assessment in two years. At night, Gelda and Radon came and they seemed pretty exhausted. The village chief summoned them and this year the target had increased by five, so they needed to kill 15 boars in total, so that was why they were looking like that. Rodan added that there would be more civilians participating later just like the last year. They tried to object but it was an order from the Lord. Teresha was so anxious. They said that it may increase to 20 next year with no negotiation. Alan didn't know the circumstances but it seemed like monster hunting was being promoted and it was troubling some since they could not defy direct orders. Suddenly, he had an idea and he said that the creator gave him wisdom, so he promised to figure something out soon and told them to leave that to him. In October, Rodan, Gelda, and Alan went back and their subordinates seemed happy to see Rodan again. They then warned Alan to not get close to the fight and he was just coming to watch them and learn. A rookie came and tried to say something but Rodan didn't let him finish and told him to just stay focused. It was time to go now. Their target number increased so they needed 20 people at that time. He spotted the two new guys and his aim was to assist them with their hunting. He had lived as a farmhand for seven years, and it was his first time going outside the village. They went outside and after a while they arrived at the Great Boar Hunting Ground. The Hakurtu Mountain was ahead of them and great boars usually leave the mountains in autumn. Just as the name indicated, there was a white dragon living on top of the mountain, and he dreamed that one day it would become his quarry. One of the workers informed the others that it was coming. The boar appeared and it was terrifyingly powerful, but Gelda and the others seemed pretty confident. The boar came at them but they collectively worked and stopped it. Their tactic was to lure the prey to them then hold it down and attack its key points. Alan informed the new guy that it was his turn now. Last year, as per the chief's order, civilians were tasked with holding the boars down because it seemed simple enough, but they weren't strong enough so it caused trouble. As a result, Alan's dad was heavily injured. Right from the start, it was a mistake to let the newcomers charge ahead. They just needed to hide and wait for the opportunity. After the new guys went to help, it was Denka's turn. Denka used his skill and Rodan defeated the boar with one move. The new ones were shocked and happy that their power was increasing. Just as Alan thought their experience greatly increased and if they kept that up, they were going to be at the front line in no time. They got a bit more combat experience now so they should be able to kill 15 boars quickly. When he hopelessly checked his status, he saw that he also leveled up and gained 400 experience points. From now on, until he earned 50 coins, he decides to hunt more boars and albaherons for more experience. He believed that his life was going to change once his level was high enough. Five months later in June, his level was at 4, and his summoning skill leveled up. He had been training his magic every day, and after one year and ten months, he could finally become an E-rank animal. There were two notable changes. Infinite tools could be stored in a black hole of about 30 square centimeters. 
which was called storage. Moreover, to create or enhance E-rank animals, he needs magic stones found in the body of the beast he kills. He wondered if the horned rabbit he hunted for food once had any stone. E-rank tones were useless, so he could pick up plenty in the forest. Gathering stones was going to be tiring, but there was that storage skill. Three months later, he could summon E-ranking animals. He also learned the intention of the game maker. He had always wondered how a summoner was going to fight and how they could make the most of their ability. The game maker was also the creator of that world and he could finally see his path now. He examined the animals he summoned. Insects weaken the opponents, animals attack, birds transmit and collect information, and the grass heals. Thus, the classes of summons take on every role in a battle, so that was the true power of a summoner. The future suddenly flashed before his eyes an army of summoned beasts that could defeat every enemy flatten every battlefield, and the leader of that army was Alan. One day the Lord Granbeal came to their village for the first time. Since he was the one who ordered them to beat 20 boars, Alan didn't like him at all. He was only there to watch them hunt boars yet he brought so many people with him. He thanked them to coming to greet him. He also said that the order of hunting 20 boar came directly from the king so he couldn't refuse. Alan was surprised that the story was getting bigger and bigger. Granville noticed Alan and asked if he was the man's son. When Alan was introduced as the hunter Rodan's child and their deputy guide, Granville's daughter Cecil called Rodan a serf. Granville got angry at her and said that the serfs were still his good people and warned her. She apologized but still glared at Alan unfriendly even though he didn't give a single care about her. Granville requested Alan to lead the way. To fulfill the royal order this time, his strongest knights were going to be the hunters. Alan firmly stated that the quota of 20 boars that Baron gave them could be an achievable goal if Karina villagers worked together according to his father. Before he could answer him, the boar hunting group had returned and they defeated three boars in just one trip, making him shocked. Their armors were noticed and Alan explained that they were made from the boar skin that the Baron gave them last year. Moreover, they also recruited 20 more hunters this year. Granville seemed pleasant with their performance. It was admirable that they could kill three boars in one day which means there were 17 boars left. Alan corrected them that only 10 were left, but that was impossible as they just started half a month ago. He said that they had more people so they could kill more boars in one trip. To conclude, he said that they could handle it by themselves for the quota of this year. Granville understood that he didn't need to worry anymore. When he was about to go, Alan respectfully stated that for future hunts, his father requested to keep the boar skin. Granville didn't think there would be any problem with that and allowed them. His assistant suggested confirming it before accepting as he was just a child, but he didn't think it was necessary because he had no reason to lie. At the village chief's house, Gelda, Alan, and Rodan were sitting in front of the leader. He said that the territory reclamation order had been spread throughout their country for 15 years. While several villages had failed to fulfill it, Karina's success was wonderful. He told Gelda and Rhoda what he heard about them leading the hunts for 10 years and praised them for working hard to contribute to the development of the village. He stated that they deserved to be rewarded for their bravery. Unexpectedly, he made both Gelda and Rodan's family commoners and told them to continue to fulfill the duties of commoners. They were shocked by that reward. Alan was filled with happiness because finally he achieved his goal. He had been aiming for this reward since he heard that the boar hunting trips were the Lord's order. He only earned five coins last year so he was pretty depressed. He was so happy that he could leave the village to go hunting whenever he wanted. Granbiel continued, saying that all the other serfs who also been hunting for 10 years or more will be rewarded as well. Whether to pay taxes as a commoner or live as a serf, they can consider their choice carefully. He then wondered why they decided to hunt C-rank great boars. Alan didn't know that either as his father had never mentioned. Prodon didn't say anything and Gelda wanted to explain. Apparently 13 years ago they started exploring that land with other serfs. However in the fall many great boars attacked and stole the food they saved for winter. They originally participated in the exploration because they didn't have enough to eat, so they had no place to return to. Then Rodan announced that they were going to hunt and eat those boars. They were lucky enough to kill one but they lost a friend in that fight. Gelda always wanted to tell Rodan to stop blaming himself for that. The leader trusted Gelda and wanted to reward Rodan's bravery in the past and said that he could ask for anything. After thinking for a moment he wanted him to allow his son Alan to work at his house. He was much smarter than his father and Rodan was sure that he would be useful to him. Not only the leader, Alan was also shocked and tried to object, but his father didn't seem to be listening to him. The leader's assistants didn't have any objections as there was no doubt that he was a smart child. Alan tried to find a way to oppose that because his dream of monster hunting was right in front of him. If he worked at the Baron's house, it would be even more inconvenient than now. But the Baron said that he wouldn't hire him as an errand boy. He wanted Alan to be an official servant of the Granbiel house. His father seemed surprised and excited, but he didn't even know there was a difference between those two jobs, and the only thing he could think is to find a way to refuse that. However, 
When he looked at his father, he saw that his face was covered in tears of happiness, and there was no way he could refuse something like that after seeing his father's proud face. With that, he became a servant for the Baron's house and was going to leave the village with the Baron in a few days. His brother was crying and Karina also didn't seem happy about that. He told her to take care but she didn't answer him back, so he offered to play night again. Both Karina's and Alan's families were watching their goodbye night play. They started to fight and they noticed that Alan was much faster now. He was literally pushing her back with his attack. Alan was dedicated to winning today and he sure did. They were all shocked that Alan won the play for the first time but he said that it was a draw and they hadn't settled it yet, so they should play again. Karina accepted and promised to be stronger next time. Alan noticed that she didn't use that move she used against the deputy commander of the knights. She was going to go to the academy soon and then serve the royal family so their chance of meeting again was slim. He used all of his magic stones for that fight but it was good to see her smiling face as a goodbye. Alan was leaving so he hugged his mother and tried to stop himself from crying in front of his little brother. He told his brother that he had to be strong to protect their little sister Miura. Dogora came and gave him a dagger from their family's shop and left. The carriage arrived and his life was about to change the moment he stepped into that carriage. His father told him that his future will now end at being a servant forever as if he read his mind and advised him to make use of that opportunity. After that he got into the carriage and left Karina to begin his life in the Granbiel house. At the Granbiel city, we see Cecil being on Alan's shoulder to pick an apple from the tree. After leaving Karina and coming to the Baron's house, Alan became the personal servant of Cecil at his request. When she tasted the apple, it was so sour so she wanted to eat pawpaw to wash out the taste and told him to go to the market and buy some for her. Day by day he was constantly ordered around by another 8-year-old girl and had no chance to go monster hunting. When he was about to go they noticed an airship and it looked like a flying city. Cecil corrected him that it was a magic ship. Her brother was going to return from the academy in spring as she mentioned. She then told him to hurry up and go. After another day as a servant he returned to the loft behind the mansion and had a good sleep. He smelled Apu which ability was restore someone's energy in 5-6 to six hours for 24 hours after smelling its scent. His room was only about the size of one room in a net cafe but since no one lived there other than him, he could practice magic as much as he wanted. He got ready and entered the mansion. Riskel greeted him and asked if he was alright being Cecil's servant. In Baron Granbiel's house there were 30 servants in total. In this world a noble house also includes their servants. However those who had only worked there for a short time wouldn't include it. After having breakfast with the servants he went to Cecil's room. He had two main duties in that house. First taking care of Cecil and serving meals. The servants' meals were simple like bread and vegetable soup, but the family's meals weren't like that. He wondered if the Baron family was trying to be frugal. Lady Granbeal noticed that Alan was used to working here now. He said that everyone had been helping him a lot. She couldn't even tell he was a serf because of his looks and intelligence, but Granbeal knew that he didn't have any talent. It was understandable that he knew a lot of things about him, but Cecil seemed surprised that he didn't. She said that she was a sorcerer and her Mihai was a swordsman. Alan was impressed as sorcerer was a two-star talent. Her father, Mr. Granbeal, warned Cecil to not carelessly reveal her talent like that. He then turned to Thomas, his other son. Thomas was crying because he didn't have any talent either but wanted to study at the academy like his older brother and Cecil. Talents were more likely to appear among low-ranking commoners and serfs, so it wasn't surprising to Alan. Two among three of their children had talents which was the real point he was surprised because it was a rare thing to happen. Lady Granbeal stated that Thomas didn't need to apologize and Mr. Granbeal added by saying he was accepted into the House of Lords and he would meet great people without talents there. Lady Granbeal mentioned that she and Mr. Granbeal met at a ball there. Cecil was going to be studying at the academy when she was 12 and start learning like Karina and Dagora. In the next scene, Alan has a day off so he goes out to the city to collect information. There was no curfew for a servant so he needed to come back before the next morning. The market was located at the north gate of the territory and it was a two-hour walk to the central square of the market. If he starts from the south gate it would take four hours. While he was exploring the city he realized that Karina Village was no match for that place. He then arrived at the Adventurer Guild. In this world, there was an organization of adventurers called the Adventurer Guild. Basically adventurers earn a living by hunting monsters and that was exactly the job Alan needed. He could earn both experience points and money. When he entered, the receptionist woman said that adventurers could only sign up when they were 12 years old, so he wasn't allowed to join. This devastated him but even though he wanted to work as a servant for a few years to please his dad, he was not planning to give up on monster hunting. Before he left the Adventurer's Guild, he noticed that there was a bulletin board for mission requests. There were a lot of species there like horned rabbits, ogres, armored ants, and so on. But strangely there was no information on where they usually live. While he was checking the board a man saw him and asked why there was a kid in there, and told him that this was not a playground. 
Alan ignored his statement and asked where he could find that type of monster. The man didn't understand why he was asking him in an annoyed manner. Alan answered that he would go away if he answered. The man explained that it was usually difficult to get to those places so it doesn't state where they live. They say the closer you get to the White Dragon Mountain, the more high-level monsters appear. Alan was surprised that he was telling him everything. The White Dragon Mountain was the place where the great boars were born. The man mentioned that he had never been there, but he heard that it would take seven days to get there from here. Since he answered Alan's question he should go away but he asked if he was familiar with the roads around there making him annoyed. Alan then noticed that there was one monster that had written its place, and it was Muttergalsh. He realized that his father named Machu after those. The man said that those things were too fast for adventurers like him so he left that to the knights. When Alan asked about the white dragon he said that he was hoping the knights would kill that one too. It was still a mystery of that place because of it they were still unable to exploit anything from the mountain. Even if the reward was a thousand copper pieces, the mission was still considered too dangerous, so no one wants to fight the white dragon even with such a huge reward. Two women came and told Levin, apparently that was the man's name, to go to celebrate as their job was done there. They then noticed Alan and said that his hair was pretty rare. Alan thanked Revan for the information and left the Adventurer Guild. He had heard what he need to know and it was pretty clear what he was going to do next. In the middle of November the weather was cold and it was going to snow soon. Alan arrived at the Granville's North Gate and the Guardian asked if he had a pass. When he showed the Baron's crest, the Guardian man apologized for asking as he didn't know he belonged to the Baron's house. Alan finds that crest pretty useful. The gate opened and the day he had been waiting finally arrived. He was outside. He had a whole day off so he excitedly started to run to go hunting. The Guardian suggested having a guard with him since it was dangerous out there but he was already gone. Alan knew that it would be troublesome to get too close to the mountain and encounter high-ranked monsters, so he aimed for the D-rank monsters. If they were like the Alba Heron, he wouldn't lose. He had run 10 kilometers and stopped in the middle of the forest. He summoned a bird named Hook and told him to move to the right by one meter to test its intelligence and it moved right away. He patted its head. It was much more intelligent now after enhancement and it was the only one among his summons that could understand all his orders. He ordered them to use their Hawkeye to look for the monsters. They were pretty far from the city by now but they didn't see any monsters. He had to wait about an hour for the Alber Heron, so it looked like the random monster encounter rate was pretty low. He took off the dagger he got from Dagora. Hook came and it looked like it was quicker to look from the sky. He continued to walk towards the area carefully. He needed to make it clearer to his summon but he couldn't find anything. Then, he encountered a bunch of goblins who were 1.5 meters tall. When he counted them there were only 5 of them. He summoned Tama and counted on them. Within a diameter of 50 meters he could summon his animal and block their retreat just to be safe. Now, Alan's first real battle started. There was a harsh fight between the Thomas and the goblins but Alan believed that Thomas could handle this. However, the goblins were using their swords and with one hit one of the Thomas disappeared. This wasn't going to be an easy win so he decided to try Ageha, a poisonous butterfly. Ageha released something and the goblins fell asleep. This gave him the chance to throw them rocks but just like Alba Heron he couldn't kill a D-rank monster with stones. He ordered Tama to go and Tama finished. He received 200 experience points from one goblin. It had been less than 2 hours but he already gained 1000 experience points with one 5 goblin. This hunt was much more efficient than he had expected and those monsters gave the most experience points so far. He then looked at one of the goblins bodies and used his dagger to take off the stone from its body. He didn't like doing that but magic stones were a summoner's lifeline and he had to collect them. Some time passed and Hook found 5 goblins within 3 kilometers from there and so far he had defeated 80 goblins and 5 horned rabbits. His level had also gone up by 2 and he was now level 9. He also learned more about Ageha's skills during his hunting experience. Its success rate was not 100% and one summon could use its skill on multiple opponents. If the opponent was 2 or more ranks higher he would need to use multiple summonses. He lost a few Thomas this time so he had got to collect more e rank stones to create new ones. But it was getting dark so he needed to go but hooks weren't moving. He asked what was wrong and noticed that they couldn't see well because it was getting too dark. He was shocked that they had normal bird's eyes. He tried to find his way home by himself and with that, the first hunting experience was over. A month passed and it became routine for him to go hunt every 6 days. It was his 4th time this month and his level was now 12. As he got used to hunting he started wanting more things. Although he still hadn't saved enough to buy good equipment and weapons, hunting monsters, earning experience points and getting better equipment was so easy. But the problem was that he only earned 50 silver coins as a servant every month. While he was about to sneak out before the sun rose one of the servants called him. They went to Mr. Granville's room and he first praised his performance and said that the butler's reports only had praises for him. However he tried to sneak out before sunrise again 
so he wondered what he had been doing on his days off this month. Alan knew that he should be careful with his lies but then decided to tell the truth that he was going to monster hunting outside the city. They were shocked by his honesty and he continued saying that he was the son of the hunter Rodan, and it was his family's way of life to hunt monsters. He aimed to sound natural to make his situation understandable. It was normal for sons to want to follow in their father's footsteps. Mr. Granville seemed like he understood him as he was the child of a hero. The butler asked what did he do with the horned rabbits he killed. This surprised him at first but he found it normal for them to think that he could only hunt E-rank monsters. The butler mentioned that if he was selling them to a butcher for pocket money, he must stop as it would cause rumors. Instead, they would pay him one silver coin for each of them. This cherished Alan a lot as he could go hunting proudly now that the discarded meat could turn into money. Six days passed and it was his another day off. He was eating his fruit while thinking about his goal for today. He aimed to kill 100 goblins today and then five horned rabbits. Hook came and started to yell at him. He wanted a minute to finish eating but the bird just didn't stop yelling. Hook then flew towards somewhere and he started to follow him. Hook was going too far because he instructed it to search within three kilometers. As he ran he started to hear some people's voices and it seemed like there was a fight. There was four goblin and the people who were fighting with them were the guy named Levin and his team from the Adventurer Guild. Levin was heavily injured so only the two of them were able to fight. Alan remembered them and immediately got three iron balls custom made by a weapon shop. He aimed one of the goblins and shot it with the ball. The girl was shocked but they didn't have time to chat so Alan only said that he was there to help. With the number two, he shot another goblin and there were only two goblins left but they weren't dying or anything. He didn't want to use his summons in front of other people so he was on his own this time. Before he ran towards the goblins he informed the other girl that he would take of those on the right. Until now he had been avoiding fighting the goblins directly just to keep his borrowed clothes clean. He already defeated one of them in a minute and then moved to the next. Meanwhile the other girl named Morishi killed one of the goblins. But Levin didn't seem like he was going to make it so she had to heal him because the other girl was almost out of mana. Morishi couldn't hold her tears back. While they were praying that Levin would be alright, Alan already killed three goblins and came for their help. The girls were shocked but he didn't care and said that he had some herbs on him and asked if they wanted to use them. The girls were desperate and were willing to pay as much as he wanted. He took off the recovery herb thinking it was probably a health recovery herb. He didn't want to use Levin as a test subject but there was no other choice. Fortunately the herb worked and his wound immediately healed. He even opened his eyes. The girls were so happy that Levin was okay and Alan was glad that the herb worked. He then moved to Marishi and healed her arm. They were shocked that it healed her arm in a second and he has the Murazi flower, which was a precious herb. Alan's father didn't heal so fast when he was injured like that. Mirazi flower could recover one's maximum physical strength and recovery herb could only heal to some extent. Levin then realized that the boy who saved his life was the boy that he met at the guild before and asked what was his talent. When Alan said that he wasn't given any talent, they were taken aback and found him pretty cool. They wanted to pay him back for saving them but all he wanted was for them to not tell anyone about him. He just wanted to go back to the hunt. They didn't mind that but asked if there was anything else. Alan wanted their magic stones from the goblins and 100 of their E-rank stones and that was enough for him. When they gave him what he wanted they headed to the city as they weren't lucky today. After they left Alan wanted to check before going back to hunting and summoned Hook. He asked why it didn't follow his instructions about staying away from other people. Hook seemed pretty timid. When he noticed its face he realized that Hook was just autonomous. Summons were supposed to follow the master's orders. Alan thought their stats and skills were for the summon to determine how to use them. But Hook ignored his instructions and prioritized its own will. So those were the type of summons created by the god of this world. He comforted Hook that he wasn't blaming him and said that next time, he would think about his instructions in case he found someone who needed help again. This time Hook warbled because of its happiness. A few days after parting with Levin's team, he now knew that the summons had minds of their own, and he had also managed to gather 100 E-rank magic stones. From now on he didn't know how he was going to progress on his path to becoming a summoner because hunting was really useful for him. In late December, while he was sweeping the floor, the knight's commander came and Alan greeted him. The commander stated that he seemed much better after two months. He sometimes came to trade information with the Baron so he was seeing him often. The knight's job was to protect the Lord, catch criminals and subjugate monsters. This was not an army created to fight with other people and it seemed like this country didn't need to worry about being involved in the war, which was a relief. They sat at the dinner table and while eating their meal, the commander asked if that meat was from the horn rabbits that Alan caught. Cecil said that he caught five rabbits in just one day. The commander seemed impressed. He informed Alan that Karina village had successfully defeated 20 great boars. Cecil's big sister and others were amazed by Alan's father. Their brother then wondered why they didn't get to taste it. As he remembered, last winter they got to eat boar meat. That was also strange for Alan because the amount of boars they caught in October should have provided tons of meat. 
He wondered if it was taken straight to the royal capital because of the king's order. Mr. Granville warned his son to not say selfish things. It seemed like the Baron's kids got to eat even less meat than the serf in Karina. He then asked Alan to catch a white deer this time, but Cecil interrupted him by saying that if he wanted to order Alan around, he had to run it through her first. Her brother whispered something in her ear and it seemed like she was convinced. Lady Granville told Tomes to not bother Alan like that. White deer was a sea rank just like the great boar. His father's team had hunted those before so it was time for him to try it himself. When his day off arrived he went straight into the forest and found a sea rank white deer. He cannot tell himself a summoner if he can't utilize his summon's ability. With his brilliant plan, he successfully killed his first white deer and received 2,500 experience points. He had hunted 100 goblins which gave him 20,000 experience points. He guessed that he would get praised for that and went back to the Baron's mansion. When he arrived Mr. Granbeal thought there was a monster that appeared in the mansion area and ordered his butlers to pick up their weapons and hold out the monster until the knights came to his aid. However, behind the gigantic corpse of the white deer, Alan was there and informed him that he had captured a white deer. Mr. Granbeal was shocked and the kids were so happy, especially Thomas. Thomas immediately informed Lady Granbeal that they didn't need to worry about the New Year party anymore and Lady Granbeal was glad. They thanked Alan and Mr. Granbeal was still questioning how Alan was truly a talentless kid. He single-handedly killed a C-rank monster at 8 years old so he ordered his workers to recheck his background. Thanks to Alan's achievement that day, the Baron family no longer worries about the meat. Once a week he was going to be entrusted with a new hunting day which included hunting monsters to get edible meat and helping people who were in trouble with the monsters. His salary was also doubled to 100 silver coins. No matter how much he hunted, his salary was fixed. He was not dissatisfied but it seemed like the Baron was in financial difficulty. He was glad that he could go hunting twice a week now. March came and the weather got warmer. Cecil woke Alan who was sleeping in the carriage where they were meeting with her big brother. Alan apologized and wondered why she brought him along with her. Today they came there to pick up Baron's eldest son, who lives in the dormitory of his school in the city. While Cecil was in a hurry to see her brother, Alan prayed that her brother wasn't similar to her. They then saw a magic ship and it was so amazing up close. He wondered what was the principle with the fueling. In this world the clocks were in the duodecimal system which was quite developed. The people were coming out of the magic ship and they saw Cecil's brother. He greeted Cecil and she ran to hug him. He then noticed Alan and stated that he was pretty young and asked if he was a new servant. He confirmed him by saying that he had been a servant since last fall. Cecil said that her servant was a hunter which the big brother found it excellent. Alan was shocked that he was way calmer than Cecil. Cecil's brother then took off a package of gifts and said that he got it from the capital. Cecil thanked him and promised to take care of it. They seemed pretty close which made Alan wonder how Mashu and Miura were doing. The next scene was the first hunting day since Mihai returned home for his spring break and Cecil ordered Alan to hunt a lot. So he hunted five horned rabbits, big toad feet, and an abarred ori. He wondered if they were having a feast when he returned. His storage was limitless but those things were too big to be put through the hole so he had attracted a lot of attention walking like that on the streets. The guardian welcomed him and opened the door. When they went inside the mansion area, he saw that Mihai and the commander were practicing. From what he saw, he found Mihai's movements amazing, and it was his first time seeing the commander using his sword. The commander decided to stop for today and stated that Mihai improved a lot in the past year. Mihai thanked him but then said that he was 13 so he didn't want him to call him young master. The whole family was watching them and Cecil noticed that Alan was back. She said that the head chef would be happy for his hunted animals. Mihai approached Alan and asked if he had time to spare with him. Alan seemed surprised and before he answered, the commander lent his sword to him. The sword was the misril as expected of the commander. It was Alan's first fight since that one against Karina. He checked his status and his status was still in hunting mode but he wanted to fight seriously. Cecil worried if Alan could use such a big sword but Thomas wasn't worried as he could defeat a C-rank monster. They got ready and the commander started their fight. Alan tried not to get hurt and be careful. With their first touch, Alan noticed that something was off as the attack wasn't really strong and the strike didn't do anything to Mihai. He didn't realize until now that he was losing speed. He went back and made a powerful attack but Mihai stopped him with one hand. While they were fighting Lady Granville seemed worried so, the commander comforted her that Mihai had survived through a year in the academy, so there was no way he could lose to someone who had never gone to school. With that, Mihai made his last attack and caused Alan to lose the match. The duel ended there and Mihai praised Alan's skill saying that he was excellent for a young boy. Alan thanked him but was still shocked at how strong he was. Cecil and Thomas came and they praised how fast their brother was. He said that he had to be fast because he was going to fight in the dungeon during the summer vacation. They seemed pretty shocked. 
He said that they were going to fight monsters in the dungeon and he was told to drop out if he can't get through it. His siblings were upset that he wouldn't be home this summer. He said that even though it could be tough, the Holy Sword Doberig gave him his sword so it was fun too. Alan was listening to him carefully and found it amazing. Exploring the dungeon and learning from the Holy Sword was indeed amazing. When Cecil asked when he was going to be at home again, Mihai said that the next spring break. Alan confidently wanted to fight with him again at that time. This surprised him for a moment but accepted. He then told him to take care of his sister and he said yes, like he was steadily establishing his position as a servant. He wanted to go hunting every day. At this rate, he was going to be Cecil's servant for the rest of his life and he knew he needed to find a way to quit without bringing shame to his dad. A few days passed and Mihai returned to the academy with the magic ship he came there with. Cecil's eyes teared up while all Alan could think about was the dungeon where Karina, Cecil, and Dagora were going to go. In the next scene, Baron Granville was hosting Viscount Clannel, who were one rank higher than Baron. Alan entered while they were talking and Viscount found his hair pretty rare. Alan served them the boar meat and Viscount Clannel seemed to like it. Alan was glaring at him with hostility because he was the one who ordered the unreasonable boar hunting. The Granville and Clannel territories lie beside each other across the White Dragon Mountain. Inside the mountain there was a vein of mithril, but the White Dragon was in the Granville territory. Thus, only the Kalnal territory flourishes by mining mithril. However, 100 years ago the White Dragon was in the Kalnal territory. The situation was the opposite of now. The two territories seem to have been on bad terms for generations because of the White Dragon and the mining of Mithril. Whatever the reason behind Viscount Kalnal's bad personality was, it didn't matter when he told the king to order the boar hunting. Mr. Granville required to know what was the reason for him to come there. He said that a few days ago his youngest daughter attended the appraisal ceremony, and he was there to tell him the result. His youngest was the same age as Mashu. Viscount happily announced that his daughter was talentless. He added that he was sorry for Lord Granbeal as two out of his three children had talents. Granbeal seemed annoyed and prayed that he would have a child with talent someday, and he would have to fulfill the noble's duty just the same as him. Alan was confused as to why was it bad to have talent because the airship was flying proudly in the sky. While the Viscount was leaving, Alan was thinking about how hassle being a noble was. By this autumn he would have been working at the Granbeal house for a year and he was now nine years old. Back in Karina, everyone must have started a new boar hunting season by now. He looked at his status, and it seemed like he was slowly getting all the necessary equipment. No matter how many times he looked at his status already, it still felt good to see that he was improving. He may even be able to hunt three times the usual today and maybe even five times if he is lucky. After killing 10,000 goblins, he finally leveled up. So today he planned to fight some higher ranked monsters. He sent Hook as always to find some monsters and after running for a while, he encountered the monster Levin mentioned, an armored Annie. The ant was about three meters tall. He summoned Tamis and they surrounded the ant. They started to attack the ant but it seemed like the method he was using wasn't very effective. He had to change the strategy and summoned a Gehas to make it sleep. Their poison seemed to work on a C-rank monster like the ant, which made Alan pretty happy. It wasn't fully effective but was good enough. He could still use this strategy on White Deer. He needed to kill it before it woke and started to look for the wound caused by Thomas. When he found it, he used his dagger to kill it but wasn't sure if his offense stat would be enough. He aimed its neck but it was still too hard. He needed a better dagger. The ant started to wake up. Alan was dedicated to not letting it escape so he used all his strength. After using his last strength, the ant was dead, and he received 3,000 experience points. He seemed relieved and started to collect the magic stone, but no matter how hard he hit, its skin was so firm that he couldn't penetrate it. With the anger from not being able to collect the magic stones, he decided to look for orcs. After a while, Hook found one and Alan started to watch it from a distance. It was pretty big, around 2 meters tall, but surprisingly it was sleeping. Alan's summons were never exhausted, but it seemed like the monsters also needed to sleep. Since it was the right time, he summoned Tamis and they started to bite the orc. It worked at first but the orc woke up and took out three Thomas in one strike. But it wasn't that important. He ordered them to scratch and they tore the orc in pieces. He received 1500 points and successfully collected the magic stones and it wasn't like the normal ones, it was a C-rank magic stone. He wondered if he would need a lot of this later. Alan was proud of himself because he killed a C-rank monster without needing to use traps, but then remembered that he was defeated by a 15 years old kid from the academy, so he couldn't consider himself as strong. Furthermore, Academy alumni like the Knight Commander or the Vice Commander must be much stronger than Mihai, although the Vice Commander lost against a 5-year-old Karina. In this world, Academy graduates are overwhelmingly powerful people, and they account for less than 1% of the population. This made Alan more willing to become stronger in this hell mode. His next goal was to kill two orcs at once. At the end of the day, he killed 15 orcs and one ant. 
with 25,500 experience points. He happily returned to the mansion. He planned about killing 40 orcs a day, which was 60,000 experience points. Early November came, and Cecil's teacher came to the Baron's mansion. Cecil warned Alan to not say anything rude in front of his teacher. Today he was allowed to attend classes with Cecil, as a present for the first anniversary of servitude. The bearded old teacher asked if Alan had any questions for him. Alan asked if he could tell him the conditions for using magic. With his summoner talent he made a hypothesis. The creator of the world set the growth rate of a summoner's intelligence at S that's why when his level went up, it also became easier to learn things. Then he wondered if his intelligence could be used for learning magic. Cecil couldn't understand why he wanted to know that, as he didn't have any talent. The teacher agreed to explain it briefly. The teacher stated that he would need a talent that could use magic. Without it he wouldn't be able to use any spell. Alan was disappointed. The teacher then mentioned that Cecil could not use magic yet even though she said she was a sorcerer. She wanted the teacher to bring out his crystal ball to prove that she could use magic. She did prove it because the crystal lit up. Alan wanted to try it too, and the teacher allowed him. It was his chance to see if he could use magic, but no matter how hard he tried, the crystal ball didn't shine. He couldn't believe magic was impossible for him because if that was the case, then what the heck was his high intelligence for? With his current status he couldn't use magic and he couldn't win with a sword either. Thus, the hypothesis was quietly denounced. December arrived and it had been a year since he was officially allowed to hunt and somehow, he had gained many more acquaintances in the city. While he was in the town he noticed some hustle between the villagers and Levin's team running towards somewhere. Alan approached them and asked what was happening. Levin said that Matagalshu appeared near the south gate. Alan asked if they were going to fight but they were definitely not. Only the strongest person in the territory, the knight commander would have a chance against that thing. But the commander and the vice commander were absent right now. That's why they need to evacuate people before the monster kills everyone. Alan acknowledged that the situation was bad because most of the adventurers in the city were talentless, so they wouldn't be able to fight it. Helping those who were in trouble with monsters was the duty of the Granville family's hunter, so Alan thought Baron would forgive him for acting on his own this time, and decided to hunt Matagalshu down. People were hurrying to get out of the place while he was going ahead of them. The soldiers were trying to close the gate before it got close to the city. Alan arrived at the gate and saw the enormous presence of the B-rank monster Matagalshu. He was taken aback by how big the monster was. It was about to eat the people in the carriage he was holding. The man was begging the soldiers to save his wife and daughter in the carriage but they couldn't even move an inch. Alan took out a ball and threw it to catch its attention. The monster growled at him and it seemed like his plan worked. He was yelling at him to make him drop the carriage so that the woman and her daughter could run away. The soldiers and Levin were shocked and tried to stop him from throwing himself into danger. Alan looked at his stats and he needed to speed up because his mana still hasn't recovered yet. He started to run away from the monster but the monster was too fast. Luckily he got away from its fits. Alan realized that the monster was not rushing to kill him it was literally having fun. He cursed at his father's naming skills. The Matagalshu was grinning gleefully while Alan was full of anger. He was about to make it regret not attacking him. He summoned bugs and birds that had the agility and endurance to dodge its attack and started to run away. Everyone was shocked that he used himself as bait. They were running towards the forest. Now that they were quite far from the city he ordered a Gehas to put it to sleep. But the monster cut the butterflies like they were nothing. After some time passed, Alan was catching his breath while hiding behind a tree. He knew he lost it because all his debuffs didn't work. He had to get more experience points for now and take his revenge after. He was glad that at least he could lure it far enough from the city. However, while he was walking the monster appeared behind him with its disgusting mocking face. He started to run away from it but then encountered the orcs and armored ants. Three days passed, and Alan arrived at the gate looking miserable. Before he could say that he was back he fainted. The soldiers carried him and contacted the Baron. They brought him to the mansion and after two days, Alan woke up. When he woke up Cecil was looking at him with a concerned face. Alan was surprised to see her this worried but she said that he was his servant so it was natural that she was worried. She asked if he was hungry or wanted something to eat but he was just glad that he came back alive. Thomas and the butler came and he expressed his happiness about him being okay. The butler said that once he felt better he should come back and report to the Baron. Alan got anxious that Baron was mad at him for staying out without permission. When he entered his room the first thing Baron said was to ask him what were he thinking. Alan bowed and apologized for acting on his own but Baron couldn't figure out why he was apologizing. Protecting the people was the duty of the knights and on behalf of the knights, he thanked her for fulfilling that duty in their absence. He stated that Alan didn't do anything wrong in this case and thanks to him, the city only suffered minimal damage. His reward was 10 gold coins and another 10 gold coins from the family on the carriage that he saved. The Baron was so generous with this, he could buy better weapons than iron swords. 
he knew he was going straight to the weapon shop. Baron also warned him to not go too far from the city next time he hunts monsters. With the relief that it all went smoothly, he promised to be more careful and left the room. After buying his new sword, he went to the corpse of the armored ant he killed before to test if it could cut it easily. As expected of a mithril sword, it was very sharp. With this monster with hard armor shouldn't be a problem. Furthermore, he made a happy discovery this time. The memories of a previously summoned beast will be carried to the newly summoned one. Hook still had memories from the previous fight, and it was watching out for Matagalshu. The summons walk with the summoner. Turn out they were entities that stored all hard-earned information and continued to grow. But in the meantime, that giant D-rank bird, those ferocious goblins, the C-rank monsters that an average adventurer can't take on alone, the B-rank monster that was overwhelmingly powerful for humans were too strong for this world. Spring had come, and the eldest son of Gabriel returned home and rematched with Alan as promised. Alan's current level was much higher than last time but his opponent was a hundred times faster than him, so must be cautious. The duel began and the whole family was watching. They started fighting but Alan was much weaker now and he lost within a minute. He was so mad at himself for losing because he had grown up so much more than last year, and his height also increased. Commander praised Mihai. Mihai then stated that Alan also improved a lot and he was surprised. Now he could rest assured that he was taking care of Cecil. Cecil whispered to Alan's ear that he should practice more to defeat her brother. At the dinner they mentioned that Aline fought against the Matagalshu. Cecil said that he was chased for three days, then got home and slept for two days in a row. Thomas asked if he could defeat it but Cecil found it impossible for him to defeat a B-rank beast all by himself, even though it was her brother. Suddenly one of the soldiers came inside the dining room and informed Baron that the white dragon had awakened. The tension in the room increased as they heard the white dragon the beast had been sleeping in the mountain for 100 years. The soldier added that an adventure guild saw the white dragon fly towards the Kalnal's territory. Baron ordered to conduct an investigation on all of the Misril mines. Commander seemed pretty chill about the situation and informed Baron that they needed to investigate the four main mines first to know the new settlement of the White Dragon. The slopes and foothills of the White Dragon Mountain were full of high rank goblins and orcs, so it would probably take a few months. Thomas and Cecil were pretty excited about all that as history was going to change after 100 years. Mihai was also excited that his return next year was going to be so much fun. Commander warned everyone to keep it a secret, as there was still a chance that the White Dragon would come back. Alan was also nervous he didn't want to lose his chance to hunt the beast by himself because of a large-scale punishment. In the first week of July, Alan checked his stats and it seemed like it was a fruitful day. The movement of the white dragon towards Kalnal was indicated. He needed to check more things out there. It took two more years to go level 1 up in summoning skill. Rank D summoner seemed to be the lowest but he wanted to see the comradeship skill first. He hoped that it was also useful like storage. He ordered Hook to comradeship and suddenly something weird happened. This was his vision through Hook's eyes, so now he could also see what it sees. He figured that it was the ability of observation assimilation for both of them. When Hook flies he notices that not just vision, but also hearing is shared as if he was riding it around. Combined with the Hawkeye skill he could see miles ahead. He then noticed that Hook flew 50 meters above him so he couldn't give orders when he was out of this range. It was the same as controlling several characters at the same time through the screens. Even though it was limited to the summons with intelligence above 100, there was no limit for quantities. For each summons he needed 200 intelligence points for comradeship. So with 1200 points, he can control 6 summons. He now understood that this was the reason why they had to keep increasing intelligence. After thinking a moment, he decided to see the new D-rank animals. He had 1000 D-rank magic stones so he could use them however he wanted. When he summoned them, there were even fish included in them. Apart from Jagabata, their intelligence was all above 100. That means he could control them from a distance. Apart from Jagabata, their intelligence was all above 100. That means he could control them from a distance using comradeship. But he was quite sad because he couldn't give orders from a distance to Tama. But now they had a team like Hook already. He then noticed something else. He just needed to use summons to hunt beasts. There was an armored ant over there and he ordered Spider to shoot and silk. The spider followed his orders and then, it was the bear's turn to come and beat it. It wasn't overwhelming but only a few summons could defeat an armored ant already. He was proud of his summon team. Haro and Hook were in charge of reconnaissance and with Harami's ability, the team's ability to dodge attacks greatly increased. It was not possible to add more troops to the battle. He thought assistance would help. With those bears taking care of both attack and defense, they wouldn't have to worry about C-rank beasts anymore. The ability of comradeship was not interrupted while he was asleep 
and the team only needed to be summoned once to be able to gain their experience continuously for 30 days. He ordered his team to not get too close to the strangers, and even when they were suddenly attacked, he told them to not fight back. While he was leaving the area, he thought about how useful this talent was. He didn't even feel uncomfortable controlling eight summons at the same time remotely, and he felt like his strength increased greatly all of a sudden. Being able to observe such a large area must have many other applications as he thought. He was still curious to see what was on the other side of the mountain range, where the white dragon was located. Then an interesting idea came up to his mind. In the Karena village, Dogora and Karena were practicing, and they called Mashu to join them. While they were joking around, Hook was watching them. Meanwhile, Rodan, Alan's father, was working in the field and noticed the strange-looking bird, Hook. Hook then checked the house to see what his mom and Miura were doing. His mother was doing Miura's hair and they seemed to be in a good mood. When Hook left the house, he dropped one gold coin for them. Alan decided to visit them every day and was actually glad that he had the comradeship skills. October was also the month he turned 10 years old. He had been working for the Baron's house for two years. While they were having their tea times, Baron asked what was the situation at the mines now that the investigation had been going on for half a year. Commander stated that just as they feared, after more than a hundred years of absence, that place was now full of magic beasts. Not only around the four mines, but magic beasts even gathered near the mithril refinery. Overall, they needed to clean up the magic beasts, recruit people to form a mining team and build a transport route. Commander believed that it would take three years to restore the nearest coal mine to this city. Three years was a lot for them. Baron knew it was overwhelming but asked the commander to try to escalate it as fast as possible. He then asked about the situation in Kalnal. Commander informed him that they were too hasty to exploit the mines and angered the White Dragon as Baron expected. Alan was glad that he didn't use the comradeship to observe the White Dragon after what he heard. It would be a big deal if all the summons ran back there in fear. Baron added that they wouldn't continue mining because that idiot Viscount didn't know what to do next. He ordered them to pay attention to him and at the same time, promote the plan to mine Mithril. With that, the Night Order's punishment had officially begun. Alan checked the situation and apparently his team defeated two orcs gaining 3,000 experience points. Once Alan was 12 years old, he would leave this place and begin his adventure guild. There were only two years left and meanwhile he decided to help with the reopening of the mines to repay them. At the foot of White Dragon Mountain was the territory of goblins and orcs, and the back of the mountain was the lair of the armored ants. The goblin king rules over the goblins, the orc king rules over the orcs, and the ant queen rules over the ants. There were also baby goblins, so seeing them made Alan hesitate. While looking with Hook's eyes, Alan noticed something. There were human skeletons in the area. The goblins ate humans and stole weapons. Before seeing that, he usually hesitated when he had to remove an exp supply but this time he decided to kill all of them without leaving one. He summoned Harami and told it to swing away. The bears were the first ones to attack. Bears were fighting with the goblins but the monsters were literally using the weapons they got from the humans they ate. They could attack from a distance so it was troublesome to hide in the shadows and shoot stealthily. He ordered Hook to be careful of the arrows and told spiders to take down the archer first. They cracked the gate and there it was, a bunch of goblins. Alan ordered his bearers to go and destroy them all. The goblins were so scared that they attempted to run away but it was useless as he already developed his troops that way. He already put 20 bears into the battle so it was an easy win for him, as he thought. Suddenly, the goblin king appeared. Alan wasn't intimidated at all and looked like he was waiting for him. Those were the warriors who had defeated thousands of C-rank beasts already, so the king of the goblins was no match for him. Not a long time later, they defeated Goblin King and received 4,200 experience points. He ordered one of his bears to bring all those goblins in one place as he needed to try to collect all the magic stones from inside their body. After collecting them all, it was time to dispose of their bodies. He took off the torch in his storage and put out the fire by itself. After firing up the bodies, the quest at the goblin village was complete. He prayed for the spirits and left the village with 48,800 experience points from defeating 223 goblins. In the next few months, he will continue to conquer goblin villages like that and would probably level up enough to catch up to Matagalshu and at the same time challenge the orc king. March arrived and Mihai was back from his duty. Cecil and Alan went there to greet him as always and Cecil was so excited to see her brother. However, Mihai seemed pretty upset. Alan also sensed that there was something strange about him. Mihai patted Cecil's head and said that she was already 10. He seemed like he missed his sister and felt bad that he couldn't see her growing. He then told Alan to fight seriously again. Alan didn't need him to say it first as he was already going to challenge him. But he was different this year. Back at Baron's mansion, the vibe was different from usual. Everyone seemed tense because of Mihai's strange mood. Alan checked the holder compete and it was his best single status for the battle. 
Before they started the battle, Mihai thanked Alan. The fight began and Alan was unexpectedly faster than ever. His agility reached 1483 and it was almost double compared to last year which is why he was sure that he would defeat him. However, even though he was faster now, Mihai blocked his attack. From the attacks of both of them, it looked like Alan was faster than Mihai. Cecil and Thomas were shocked that their brother was losing against Alan but Commander didn't think so. Alan was obviously faster than him but Mihai still could block all of his attacks, but he was still dedicated to win this time. However, with Mihai's sudden attack, Alan lost the battle. Alan was feeling frustrated, even speeding up couldn't give him an advantage, and he wondered if it was because he was not precise enough when swinging his sword or wasn't fast enough. While he was brainstorming the possible reasons why he lost, Commander praised Mihai. Something was definitely wrong with Mihai because he didn't shake Alan's hand this time and ignored him. Baron stated that it had been three years of training at the academy, and Mihai was so much stronger now. Mihai thanked his father with gratitude. Cecil approached Alan and praised him for how strong he become compared to before. She asked if he would like to be Mihai's disciple tomorrow so that he could teach him the way of the sword, and Thomas would like to join them too. Alan would be honored if he approved. Mihai called for Cecil and Thomas and said that he had something to tell them. He said that he will have to do nobility's obligation for the next three years so he can't go home during that time. Thomas and Cecil were shocked by this sudden news. Thomas asked what was the obligation, but Mihai wasn't allowed to reveal it yet. When Cecil asked when he was going to start, he stated that it would start tomorrow. Cecil turned to her father with expectations, but they couldn't say anything. Cecil said that she wanted to stay with her brother for a long time. Mihai promised to send her letters and after three years he would be back. Three years was too much for Cecil and she started to cry. Alan remembered the conversation between the Viscount and Baron so he understood why he was so mentally prepared. But still he smelled something fishy. At the mansion, Alan asked Rickle what was the nobility's obligation, but he hadn't heard of that before. He was surprised that even someone working at the Baron's house for 12 years didn't know about it. Mihai appeared on top of the stairs wearing armor. Thomas told Cecil to come out and say bye to her brother. She hugged him while sobbing, and it was such a sad moment for them. Baron stated that Mihai was the pride of the Grabiel family, and Mr. Grabiel wished for him to do a good job and come back safely. The other butlers wished him a safe journey, but Mihai walked towards Alan and hugged him. Alan didn't know what to do or say and froze for a second. Mihai whispered to his ear. He admonished him to take good care of his sister and protect her. Alan agreed and noticed that he was shaking. Before getting into his carriage, Mihai stopped and wanted them to allow him fulfill his obligation for the family. Cecil waved at him while crying. Alan thought about future. After three years, it was time for him to leave and Cecil was going to the academy. While being a servant, he would still be devoted to protecting her. In the next scene, it had been two months since Mihai left. Last year, Alan started fighting the Goblin Village in October, and he was already one step faster than the Night Order. 52 Goblin Strongholds and over 10,000 Goblins had been defeated by him, and there were almost no Goblins left in this White Dragon Mountain. And also, his level had increased significantly. He was at the forest and the Night Order was about to be there tomorrow so he needed to hurry up. He was at the place where the one he had never been able to defeat reigns, the Orc King. Just as he expected, he didn't know how many enemies there were only by examining from above. Similar to the strategy in the Goblin's Village, he had an ambush summoning team at the back and pincer tactics to destroy the enemy. But this time, there will be brawn to support ranged attacks. He ordered his brothers the bears to get started, and the hunt began. They arrived at the gate of the orc village. The orcs immediately started to attack the bears and Tamas, but they were used to fighting, so when it's one-to-one, -one, his bears were too strong. For the archer orcs, he ordered bronze to protect, but there were so many of them, so one of the bears got injured. However, even though he had an arch on his body, the bear still fought. Alan was shocked and couldn't read the instant HP of the summons so they would all fail if they keep going tirelessly and forget about their wounds. He ordered spiders to kill the archers. They successfully defeated the orcs and kept marching forward. When they entered the village, there were more than 200 orcs coming for them, which was the chance to gain more experience points. He ordered bears to attack them, while the ambush team from behind also launches an attack. Everything was going well so far but it took longer than the goblins. He had already defeated about 100 of them but wondered why the king hadn't appeared yet. Suddenly a huge amount of magic power appeared and they barely could defend themselves. Alan was taken aback by the orcs because there should only be one boss, instead there were three of them. It was a dangerous situation but Alan seemed like he was glad to have his first magic attack from the beast. Alan couldn't understand if they were aiming at him or at Bronn. The orcs send another fireball. It was so hot but at this rate he could still handle it. However, this time they sent three fireballs. Orcs knew how to aim where Bronn wasn't covering. He took off a stone from the storage and threw it to the orcs. He managed to defeat one of the orcs and got 2,000 experience points. He had two iron balls left so he must not miss the shot. 
When he was about to throw it, the king disappeared. They were out of his attack range and it was hard to handle everything as his battle strength was being lessened. Plus, there were still hundreds of them waiting for him to attack. It was time to quit playing defense and become a bitter battle. He still had enough magic stones to call another 20,000 bears. Moreover, he had 100 magic balls made from zero rank beasts. Until his magic power was exhausted, those 30 warriors would be the defensive wall. While the battle was continuing, he heard the sound of the king orc. And when he looked at the top of the hill, there it was the B-rank orc king, who was the same level as Madagalshu. His bears were so small compared to it, he growled at the bears and with his one swing all the bears surrounding him were dead. He immediately summoned more but the monster was not being affected. He lost his army faster than the speed of summoning animals for reinforcement. It was so big that the bears couldn't do anything. Another fireball came and bronze weren't strong enough to protect themselves from that one. Since the bronze were dead, he couldn't protect himself from the other fireball so he had to use the bears. His injuries were hurting him so he ate Mamataru's special fruit of life. Even though he was exhausted, he was dedicated to fighting till the end. He wondered if he could still dodge magic attacks in this position and if there was any possibility of regaining the initiative against the enemy. Retreat was his other option, which he hated. Suddenly the commander appeared in front of him, stating what a bitter battle is. Alan was taken aback because he thought they would come tomorrow. Apparently the knight commander saw the smoke so he came to check it out. He asked what he did and Alan said that he was just trying to raid the orc village. The commander then noticed the bears, making Alan nervously tremble. The bears shouldn't be mixed with magic beasts, so he made them disappear and suggested the commander go back together. However, the commander ignored the summoned beasts and didn't seem to falter in front of the king orc. Alan heard before that he could defeat Madagalshu alone and that he was the strongest man in Granville territory. The commander instructed the others that he was going to defeat the orc king himself and the rest was up to them. Alan was surprised to see the deputy team. He originally intended to secretly monopolize the experience but this was still good. It was a chance to observe those two show their true power. The commander and the king orc were standing in front of each other without doing anything, making Alan wonder if it was safe to stand like that. The king orc made the first attack and swung its weapon on him but the commander stopped it with only one hand. Lord Knight Commander fought for a long time with a fighting style that overwhelmed the opponent and earned the nickname, the Battle Demon Xenon. The fight was crazy. The King Orc was not giving up on attacking him but the commander was dodging its moves like it was nothing. Alan now understood why they called him the Knight Commander because he didn't seem to be inferior to that giant opponent. Rifran was also ready to clear the other orcs. He noticed that the Magic Orc was the cause of the fire so his first aim was them. He threw himself in the middle of orcs and aimed directly at the Mage Orc. The Mage Orc sent another fireball but didn't affect him at all. Meanwhile, the Knight Commander sliced the King Orc with one attack. His face was so firm that it seemed like he cut a leaf or something. Alan was amazed by the fact that the orc was nothing more than a fly in front of the knight commander. Not only him, but the vice captain Refran was also strong. The current move seemed to be the same as Karina's previous extra skill, which meant that one star spearman and three star sword saint both possessed that skill. All thanks to their talent. He then realized that the knight commander didn't even need extra skills to defeat the orc king because he was incredibly strong. The commander approached Alan and told him to stay with him, and after evening, the knights would arrive. Alan felt a little worried because he didn't ask anything else, so he asked if he could take the magic stones from the corpses. He allowed Alan to do that and while Alan was collecting the stones, they looked at each other with concerned faces. The commander then said that if they left the barracks like this, the monsters would return so they should burn them down. His thoughts were exactly the same as Alan. The knight would take care of the rest tomorrow as it was getting dark, so they decided to go back to the barracks for a rest and talk to the baron tomorrow. They put up some tents and set up a fire to cook dinner. While they were eating, the commander asked how many goblins he killed, and when he heard that he killed more than 52, he said that it was more than he guessed. The commander explained that four years ago a large amount of Albaharan feathers from Karina village was found near the site where the holy sword was discovered. Moreover, that village exceeded the target of hunting pigs by 10 pigs every year. And then Alan was accepted as a servant of the Grabiel family as a reward. After Alan came to the mansion for a while, suddenly outside the city appeared a lot of demonic beast corpses, whose magic stones had been taken away. Most recently they had found the bodies of several goblins that had lost their magic stones as well as traces of a burned out village. He guessed that Alan had been hunting alone and managed to defeat a C-rank monster. And another piece of evidence was the progress in the battles with young Master Mihai. The commander had always wondered why the appraisal showed he didn't have any talent, so he asked the officials there and they still confirmed the same. 
but he wondered how they remembered the result of such a normal person from five years ago like that. It was because, at that time, there was a very blinding light coming from the strange boy with black hair and eyes. Then, when information about his talent appeared, they couldn't read clearly so they had to say no talent due to his low stats. He believed that Alan had his own talent the ability to fight with animals, and Alan confirmed him. Alan decided to answer honestly because if he confessed that he had been given special powers by this world's creator, he would get himself into a bunch of trouble. But the commander didn't say anything and continued to eat. He said that this was just the result of his small investigation and the Baron had already known about his talent, making him shocked. That was the reason why he gave him hunting days. It was true that it was a bit generous for a kid like him. He wondered why he allowed him to be so carefree like that but the commander said that he can't tell him now but when the time comes he will know the answer. The commander promised to not say anything to the Baron about today and to keep it a secret. But in return, he asked him to provide a detailed report on the demonic beast's hunts. After all, they were having the same goal. Alan accepted his terms because he shouldn't avoid it anymore as he needed to gain experience points. One of the soldiers came and informed the commander that the bath was ready. Alan felt guilty and offered to wash the commander's back to express his gratitude for saving his life. When he got ready, he entered the bath and encountered the scars on the commander's back. He couldn't believe he survived those deadly injuries. The commander asked what was wrong and Alan asked if he was okay and mentioned that he also brought some healing medicine. The commander stated that he was fine and Alan started to clean his back. While he was washing the commander's back he was thinking about hunting and how annoyed he was for not being able to defeat an orc king by himself. The commander asked if he felt happy while hunting as if he read his mind. After considering for a moment, he said that it was definitely fun the feeling he get when he keeps practicing and gets stronger. From what he saw from the commander's back, old wounds will heal as his level increases. He remember there was a wound on his face when he met him five years ago. After the bath was over, Alan fell asleep pretty quickly. After a day and night, they returned to the mansion and reported destroying all the bases occupied by monsters. Cecil scolded Alan for leaving her. Baton came and he seemed glad that Alan was fine. Even though he went out without permission and was not chastised for it, he didn't get mad at him. After two weeks since Alan was saved by the knights, Alan started his 2 dn orc subjugation and finally defeated the orc king. At first he let 40 bears attack from all sides because simultaneous attacks reduce the fastest number of enemies, preventing them from forming a formation, and it prioritizes hitting magical orcs first as well. He then continued summoning additional bears to make up for the number of bears that had been defeated, leading the orc king's power to be fully depleted. He could keep increasing his forces till the opponent was depleted as long as he didn't get attacked and the experience points he gained from the orc village were seven times more than defeating the goblin village. Failure was the mother of success, even in the game. Alan started to collect the magic stones and from on top of it the orc king was really big. He got his first B-rank magic stone. This time he used over 120 D-rank magic stones. He should calculate more savings next time. October came and he turned 11 years old. Since May he had destroyed 20 orc villages. He thoroughly reported to the knight commander as he promised. The time frame for remining Mithril had been reduced from 3 to 2 years. Next spring was the time to remine Mithril as well as other necessary minerals. Everything was so advantageous and at this rate he would eliminate all the orcs and would hunt for armor ants by next year. After turning 12 he would begin his life as an adventurer. The messenger of the king arrived at the baron's mansion. Alan didn't like that man as he was simply there to scare them and then raise the tax. Baron greeted him and asked what was the reason for his visit this time. The man praised his loyalty toward the king. Alan found it strange that he was being sweet all of a sudden. The man took out a box and said that he had something he would want Baron to receive personally. It was a letter from Mihai. This made parents nervous while Thomas and Cecil seemed happy. When Baron opened and started to read the letter, he started to sweat and tremble. He couldn't believe what Mihai wrote in the letter. It had been three months since the man received his letter. Mrs. Granville took the letter and started crying the moment she started reading it. The man then informed them that Miguel Granville, their dearest son, passed away after doing his best for the nobility's obligation. Baron was mad as hell he couldn't believe something like that could happen as it had only been a half year since Mihai went, and there was no way a nobility family like his could be put in such a dangerous place. Mrs. Granville couldn't stand up and fell on her knees crying her eyes out. The man then left after saying that they would talk about the funeral money later. A huge silence filled the room. Alan was still shocked. He recalled the memory of Mihai telling him to protect his sister and couldn't believe he had foreseen this coming. Cecil was still in shock and asked her father what was going on and what Mihai wrote in the letter. Baron told everyone to leave the room, including Thomas. Alan found this pretty weird. 
The door closed and Alan was in the hall swiping the floor while all the maids were crying about Mihai's unexpected death. The entire Baron family was shocked after reading that letter so Alan really wondered what was written in it. Cecil's angry voice was heard from the hall. It seemed like Baron was trying to explain to her that it was all for the nobility's obligation, but Cecil denied believing that their lives were this worthless that they were sacrificed like that. She stormed out while sobbing. Alan realized that Cecil would have to follow the same path as her brother in the future. The idea of that made him furious at the Baron but when he saw his face he realized that there was nothing else they could do, and this was the duty of all nobles. At night when the dinner was ready, the butler and Alan brought her food to her room but she wasn't answering. Baron told them to leave her alone and talk tomorrow. Cecil had already gone to bed but Tomes was still panicking. After all, he was the next lord of the Granville family. The morning arrived and neither Thomas nor Cecil ate breakfast. Rickle said that before coming there he heard rumors that Gabriel's family had a short life. The Baron's parents and brother also passed away very early, even knowing that he was still so upset about the young master's sudden death. Suddenly one of the butlers came and informed everyone that there was an emergency. The maids also informed Baron that Cecil was not in her room anymore. Everyone split up and started to look for her. Her room's window was open so Alan wondered if she escaped that way. There was a possibility that she already left the mansion so he went outside of the mansion and summoned Hooks to look for her. She would have been seen if she had escaped by the main door so she must have gone through the back door. While praying that she wouldn't do anything foolish, he continued running. In the city Cecil felt super tired and sat on the floor to catch her breath. She was missing Mihai so much and continued crying. Then she heard Alan's footsteps. She asked if he came to force her back but he denied saying that his duty was to accompany her. After all, he was her most loyal servant. Cecil told him to leave her alone and he didn't have to care about him but her sentence was interrupted by her growling belly. She got embarrassed and said that it was because she hadn't eaten anything since last night. Alan took out some things and told her to eat them for now. She didn't object to anything and started eating in silence. She was still crying for her brother. Her brother was so strong so she was sure that she would have to die too. Alan noticed that she knew something already. He previously learned that this kingdom had never been at odds with its neighbors so it was probably not a military draft. At first Alan needed to find a way to coax her so he asked if she would like to get out of this town with him. She was taken aback for a moment so Alan explained that it would be a trip to forget about all the negative things. She didn't believe they could do something like that. He said that for now, they should go home and when he reached 12, he would sign up as an adventurer and go out to travel. That was the first time he mentioned this to her and she was obviously surprised. She found it impossible because she would have to go to the academy. He asked if she was ready. He was talking about the right to choose how she lives. So he asked what kind of life she wanted to live. Cecil seemed scared at first but after thinking a while, she seemed like she made up her mind and was ready to go home. Since she was tired she told him to carry her. While Alan was walking towards the mansion, Cecil thanked him. They arrived at the mansion and Cecil seemed scared of her father but Baron hugged her tightly. They were just glad that she was still fine. Baron said to her that she didn't have anything to worry about now. Mithril mining had restarted and when they were recognized by the royal family, the nobility's obligation would also be waived. Alan regretted that he didn't start collaborating with the knight earlier, as there would be a chance for Mihai to survive. Suddenly, Cecil said no. She said that she was Cecil Grabiel, and in the name of the family, she was going to fulfill his nobility's obligation. She was going to go on the same road that Mihai did, and will never go away. In the next scene, it had been half a year after young master Mihai's funeral. The Grabiel family was now returning to normal. The orcs' barracks were all destroyed by the knights even though he did most of the work. Therefore, they had complete control over the mithril mines, and after the summer, mining would begin. Alan was glad that the Baron could rest now. Now it was simply a matter of keeping an eye on Kalnul, who had just lost his mining rights. He was so quiet, making the commander suspicious. March arrived and we saw Alan climbing on a cliff. Before he went out hunting, Cecil wanted to come with him but he was so clever and didn't let her go up with him when climbing like that. Everyone knew she wanted to be stronger but she still needed the Baron's permission to do anything. However, mages could cast magic for ranged attacks, it was tempting to think about. Looked like he reached the right place. Another obstacle in mining next on his menu was the C-rank magic beast armor ant. There were possibly 1,000 in this cave and a B-rank queen ant was the one who spawned them all, according to Levin's information. This time he had less information than usual. He also can't use scouting from above in this battle. The size of the entrance was just big enough for an ant monster. He wondered if they designed it on purpose because it was too narrow for them to just go in one by one. He wondered if it would be a clever move to reduce the number of enemies before the raid, and summoned his monsters. He was going to arrange the backline similar to the one he used against the orcs and let six out first. In a world in which he had to master himself without any manuals he dared to fight every opponent, and he ordered the bears to go ahead. 
as he estimated there were about a thousand of them and he was going to use all his forces to beat them one by one. He had figured out all of the ants' weak areas from previous battles, so it was easier this time. In retrospect, it was still a waste of military resources somewhere, because a full blow from a gigantic ant would force a bear to collapse. He must unite numerous bears against one ant, but the bear's intelligence was not high so he could only do simple commands. They make a lot of mistakes when teaming up. He called Hook and made him inform every bear. The tactical effectiveness was going to considerably improve, but unfortunately even though it had been a month, he still could not be able to wipe out the first ant cave. Twice a week he kills more than 200 each time so it should be 2000 in a month so he thought the lack of information was not a problem. Now that he thought about it something weird happened a few days more than 200 ants were killed, their bodies disappeared. He wondered if the queen ate all of them and immediately gave birth to a new batch. Even though he got a lot of experience this time they kept crawling out, making it difficult to gather all of the magical stones. He had to change his strategy before making another attack on the cave. In May the Baron had agreed to change the service and hunting schedule, now he could hunt two days in a row. He had been there watching all the time and so far he killed more than 300. Suddenly, he and the bears heard something. Alan's plan worked because it stopped. It looked like they had stopped coming out of the cave. Except for the queen there was probably a lot inside the cave so the first goal was to send more summoned beasts to scout the area. He sent a bunch of holos to examine the area. It was like a giant maze and there were small rooms. After a while the ants found them so now he had to summon it again. He ordered bears to clean up the remaining ants. It was true that bears were bad at seeing in the dark so he was going to direct them through Haro's night eye. He then found the room of the newborn ants. Alan was focused on controlling eight summons at the same time. He was deciding which direction the bears were going to attack and how Haro's continued to scout the other way. He knew that he must give exact instructions because not a single one was allowed to live at this time, but unfortunately they got blocked again. He ordered Haro to go back to the cards. It felt like he was solving a minigame in an RPG. It was also getting dark so they had to get back to the mansion but if they put this opportunity aside for now, he didn't know how he would get another chance like that. Then he found the queen ant without a doubt. He tried to calm down as his opponent was a B-rank monster. His current intelligence was only enough to control 8 beasts at the same time. The queen's room was about 5 kilometers west and there were 10 other ants. He needed to change his tactics to balance his strength. He summoned another hero and started to run towards the queen's room. The bears were ready for his orders and Alan had been waiting for this moment for two months. So he was not willing to let the queen. The queen was really long, about three times longer than the normal ants. But the head was still the same size. First he needed to build a solid defense line so he ordered the bears to take down the soldier ants. While the bears were killing the ants, he had to clean up the mess in the way first. But the queen ant was also attacking them and apparently they know his strategy. But it was okay as they acted very slowly. He ordered the bears to take advantage of the enemy's slowness and aim for the abdomen to attack. While the battle continued Alan felt like they were inviting him to attack. But at the end, the queen ant was defeated by only 20 bears, which made him confused because it was more than 100 when he defeated the orc king. Now he probably won't be able to return to the city in time so he has to sleep outside again. He wondered if the master would get angry this time, and he cannot get any more help from the knights. He needs to bring back the spoils to provide the reason for his absence. The queen ant was so smelly, it took two months to conquer the first ant cave. He wondered if that meant while he killed 5,000, 4,000 new larvae were born, which was why the queen became weak. Even a magic beast still needs to eat and sleep to stay healthy, so this time the enemy wasn't in its best condition. He got the magic stone but then noticed something on the floor. There was another weird looking stone but he couldn't understand what kind it was, but then he had an idea. The next day the Baron seemed annoyed that Alan was gone out on his own for an entire day the second time. He had to order all the knights to find him so he asked if he had any excuses. Alan asked for his forgiveness and stated that he carried out a mission on the slopes of the White Dragon Mountain, and yesterday he finished conquering the Armor Ant's lair and defeated the Queen. He informed him that he was committed to completing this task because he knew it would assist the Granbeal family with an assertive tone. Baron was shocked and Cecil didn't believe him, and told him to come up with a better lie. Alan remembered that the news of his invasion of the monster territory hadn't reached the Baron's family yet, so he wanted them to allow him to show the proof. He took out the shell of the queen ant that he killed yesterday. They were all too stunned to speak. He thought they would be happy but they didn't react at all. The Baron stated that it was a strange color and it was very different from the normal ant's armor. He asked Xenoff, the knight commander, if it really belonged to the queen ant, but Xenoff had never seen a queen ant either. They had never thought that they could destroy the ant's lair before because it was a bit too much for the knights. 
Alan was surprised to hear that while Cecil was sure he painted it on purpose to trick them, he immediately denied the accusations and said that the knight commander should be able to defeat the queen too. The commander Zenuf stated that he had estimated that they would have to bring a team of thousands to destroy such a giant ant colony. Breaking in through the door was tiring enough, not to mention it was a huge maze that was easy to get lost in. So they launched the campaign, the sacrifice would be huge, and no adventurers would even venture there either. He also mentioned that he had never heard of anyone successfully defeating them until now. The highest goal of the knight's conquest was the orc and goblin villages. Cecil was still suspicious and asked again if he really killed thousands of ants and explored the labyrinth. He confirmed exasperatedly. It was hard to say that he used summoned beasts to do that. He then wanted them to look at the stones he found in the queen ant's room and asked if it was mithril. Not only the baron but even the emotionless commander seemed pretty surprised. The baron couldn't believe that he could pick that up like something random. Now that he showed them the mithril, Alan was sure they believed him. Even Cecil seemed to believe him. The Baron told Alan to follow him and tell him all he needed to know. While they were leaving the area, Cecil was looking at Alan proudly. In the Baron's room, the commander asked Alan to show him the cave he conquered. The commenter stated to Baron that the knights would immediately be dispatched there. Alan interrupted and said that he also had a map of the cave, making them surprised again. The Baron stated that staying out all night was excused because his feat this time was remarkable. And with this recovery, he had added his name to the list of those who had discovered the nation's valuable mithril mines. According to the law, he was going to be entitled to 30% of the mining results according to the mining rights granted by the king. Alan seemed confused so the butler explained that by default, half of the mithril would be given to the royal family, and the mining right was for those who were allowed to benefit from the rest. To be clear, seven parts will be given to the king, and three parts will be Alan's, as the butler said. Alan did not expect this kind of big catch but decided to enjoy it. That is the end of the recap for now. Please read the pinned comment about the next part.